Just go up, just lift them up and have a conversation with the Lord just for a moment. Lord, we're glad to be here. And if you're glad to be here, just lift up your hands and say, Lord, I thank you that I'm here. Thank you. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come this day, Lord, again to say thank you. We thank you for the overwhelming grace and mercy that you've made available to all of us through Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for another day. Not only are we are physically able to come, but we thank you, Lord, that you gave us a mind to be in a place of worship this day. We thank you, Lord, that we're here today because we know it is by your divine account, your divine accord, your divine will that we are in this place today. And so we ask God that you remove anything that may hinder us from hearing from you right now. Lord, do spiritual surgery on all of us in this place, Lord, that we will slide spiritually to the edge of our seats, waiting to hear from you. We pray, God, right now that anything, Lord, would hinder our ears from hearing, Lord, move it out of the way. Anything to hinder our minds from thinking, remove it right now. And we pray, God, that it would not only hit our ears and go to our hearts, but take root in our lives that we may walk according to your will. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, first of all, for the certainty of our salvation. Because we know, Lord, we live in an uncertain world, but we thank you, Lord, that we are certain about our salvation because of the work of Jesus Christ. And then, God, we pray that you'd empty the preacher out right now, Lord. Move him out of the way in all his frailty, all of his weakness. Fill him up, Holy Spirit, that your word will take life in this place. Like a rusty, mighty fire, Lord, that we will catch on fire and seek to do, Lord, that which you called us to do. Lord, speak to our hearts. Then when we leave out of here, we will leave out with our heads held high, knowing that we already have the victory in Jesus Christ. Speak to our souls, Lord, that doubts will go away. Speak to our souls, Lord, that fear will leave, and we'll be left, Lord, with faith, and faith only in you. We say thank you. If you're grateful for the Lord, say thank you, Lord. We say thank you, Lord, because you have truly been better to us than we've been to ourselves. We say thank you, Lord. The name that is above every name, and the only name by which we may be saved. In the name of Him that lived and died but lives forevermore, in the name of Jesus, we say thank you, Lord, and amen. Now, if you're glad to be here, give God some. I'm glad I'm here, praying so I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad I'm in this place, praying. Hallelujah. Amen. Hey, Talk to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, I'm glad to see you. And I'm so glad that you are here today. Let me do this quickly before we go much further. There's a group of young men that are on about the fourth or fifth row. Young men. We're all young men. These are some of my closest friends. These are my fraternity, actually my line brothers. We're celebrating 30 years together in Omega Sci-Fi fraternity. If you would, just give God praise that we're still here. And I know we've done fellowship, but if y'all would just go ahead and welcome them a little special. So go over there and give them a hug and shake their hands and tell them you're glad they're here. And they just move around and tell them thank you.
got your Bibles, join me in the book of John. I must note that one of my line brothers is here has just completed his master divinity. He's an ordained Baptist preacher. Reverend Kenneth Burton. Amen. Matter of fact, come on up here and sit over here with me. Sit over here with me today. Like I said, my line of brother was up here with me today. Come on here. He's a he's entering his second career, but spectacularly successful and impacting in his first career and in banking. He has an MBA from Duke University in finance, but now he's moving to the greater work of doing the work of the Lord. And I know that his impact would be similar, if not more spectacular, as he seeks to do that which God has called him to do and has directed him to do. In the book of John, chapter 5, we're continuing our series, our journey. If you, your legs work, we ask you stand as we honor the word of God. We're continuing our work and our study on the transforming power of God in our lives as we have encounters with him. The book of John chapter 5, when you get that, say amen. 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 We're going to read just a few verses here in chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. And the Bible says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five porches. And verse 3 says, gives us a different, a, a kind of a, expect, a, some exposure on who was there. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water, and whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And the Bible says in verse 5, there was a certain man that was there, which had an infirmity of thirty and eight years. And when Jesus saw him laying there and knew that he had been there a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Now the impotent man answered and said, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. And Jesus, look at this verse 8, Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And the Bible says, And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. If you would turn to your neighbor next to you and say, Neighbor, watching and waiting is okay. But being willing will get you well. Amen. 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 Watching and waiting is, is all right, but being willing will get you well. Over the last couple of weeks, we have looked and watched this. We see Jesus moving first into Samaria on his way to Galilee. Uh, and we recognize that during this movement of Jesus doing his earthly ministry, there were some great things that took place. We first of all recognize that in chapter 4, uh, when Jesus came into the contact with the woman at the well, that Jesus did not just happen into Samaria, but instead was on a divine appointment from his father to come to Samaria, that this woman's life would be changed. We remember the Bible says, let us know that this one, Jesus came to Samaria not because he had to, but because he wanted to go through there, because he knew that there was a woman who needed his uh, intervention. There was a woman who needed his help in transforming her life. We looked at that woman. She started off a bitter woman, mad with an attitude. But when she left, she left with the joy of the Lord, I believe, because she wanted to tell somebody about Jesus and actually said, come see a man who was able to tell me all about myself. In other words, uh, from a human perspective, most folks don't want to be exposed or revealed to who they really are. There was something about this conversation, this connection, this contact with Jesus that made this lady not only all right with what Jesus said, but also made her happy that she met a man who knew all about her, and yet did not judge her, and yet who was willing to change her life. If you remember also, Jesus gave her and told her that was something that he had was nothing like anything anybody else had. It was not just about getting water out of the well, but Jesus said, I give you something on the inside that would give you new life all throughout the rest of your life. That would change your attitude, your outlook, and your posture toward living. 
So we see that impact. We see that appointment. Jesus' first appointment with uh, this woman at the well. And then if you move on through chapter 4, you see that Jesus then came in contact with another somebody. The Bible didn't give his name, but says he was a nobleman who had a son that was sick unto death. In other words, if you keep reading down in chapter 4, you see that there was a man who had great resources. But instead of this man who had great resources going to the doctor, going to the Mayo Clinic, he had heard about Jesus. And as a result, he went to Jesus and asked if Jesus would heal his son. And the thing I like about this uh, communication, that Jesus again was moving on his way to doing some more work. But while he was moving, he was still willing to help those he came in contact with. So this moment we came to Jesus and Jesus did not uh, change his route. But instead, Jesus just spoke a word. He, he said, your son lives. This man came to Jesus with a son, the Bible says, who was sick unto death. But all Jesus had to do was speak. And the Bible says that the man, the young boy, was healed. Can I do that one more time? This man had a son who was sick unto death. He came to Jesus and said, help my son. And Jesus simply said, thy son liveth, and the boy was made well. If you look at the story a little deeper, the next day, uh, when the man got back to where his son was, they came and ran, said, guess what, your son's all right. And the man said, what time did his situation change? And the Bible lets us know, they said about 2 o'clock, and the man knew that it was exactly when Jesus spoke. I want us to hold on to the power of the word of God. All Jesus had to do was speak it, and it came to pass. And the Bible says that as a result of this encounter with Jesus, that this man and his whole house believed in Jesus. But the Bible says in that text one day in chapter 5 that it was after this, after that Jesus had declared this son was going to be alright and he was alright. That Jesus then and his disciples came to this feast of the Jews. And in this feast, the Bible says Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now I want to paint this picture properly. That there was a feast of the Jews, which meant that all those who were gathered there, there was a crowd around, there were folk around, there were folk around to celebrate this feast of the Jews. The Bible does not tell us which feast it was, but we do know it was a celebration time. And as it came to the celebration time, verse 2 says that in Jerusalem, by the sheet marker, there was a pool which was called Bethesda because it had five portions. I'm going to show you all how it looked now. So there was a lot of people there because it was a celebration weekend. Now, then they came to Jerusalem, to the sheep market, because it was there that a lot of people gathered. It was not necessarily a sacred place, but it was a special place. In other words, it wasn't some place where people couldn't get to, but it was a place that people would gather at because it was near to a place of celebration for the Jews. Now, the crowd, look at the crowd in verse 3, it gives you a, a picture of the crowd. In this crowd of folk who had gathered at Jerusalem, by the sheep market pool, which had five porches. I want you to picture like this. It was a pool, a, a, a spot, so to speak, surrounded on all sides by covered columns so that people could hang out in the shade, but when they got ready, they could go into the pool. So it was a place of gathering, a gathering place. But in this gathering place was not sunbathers, it was not vacationers, it was not folk who were, who were just hanging out to, to be social. It was a group of people in Birch Street that looks a lot like us today. The Bible says there was a great multitude of impotent folk, sick folk. Some of them were blind. Some of them couldn't walk. Some of them had withered limbs. Some, some, some of them had some real issues. Some of them looked sick. Some of them faked like they weren't sick, but you could still tell something was wrong. Some of them uh, had been there for a while, but it was a multitude of people. That was a multitude of folk. I want y'all to picture this right here. If, if you look go outside our church, if you go down any of these streets, there's a multitude of folk who look the same way. The truth is, if we look in the mirror, some of us will see the same thing in us. Some of us are, are, are sick. Some of us are, are weak. Some of us are blind. Some of us are hot. Some of us are with us. Some of us ain't what we could be. We might not be what we used to be, but we still ain't what we ought to be. But we, we look at ourselves in the mirror and recognize that God got some more work to do on us. i tell you right here, let me do it because commercial break. If you look at yourself in the mirror and you think you are all of that, you think you're complete, guess what? You got a real problem. If you don't see some other areas that God can fix you, you got a challenge. And they were there. Multitude of folk. 
multitude of folk. And this, this, this text right here gives us a couple of pictures. First of all, it lets us know what the Lord can do for us. But it also lets us know what we ought to be doing for those the world. Let me say it one more time. See, church ain't just about you getting changed. It's about you getting changed so that we can be used by God so that somebody else's life can be changed. If you are in church, of you trying to be with the Lord just so you can be helped, guess what? You are selfish. You are the one to get help so you can help somebody else. Oh, there was a multitude of folk and they were there. But the Bible goes a little bit further, verse 3. The people were waiting. I, I, for the longest time I read this text, I, 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 I thought I understood it, but I believe it, if it goes a little deeper. They were waiting for the moving of the water. Now, why was that important? Verse 4 tells us, for an angel, periodically, went into the pool and troubled the water. The water moved. And when the angel did that, whoever got into the pool first was healed, the Bible says, of whatever disease they had. In other words, whatever was wrong with them, if they could get into the water while the water was still moving, they could be healed of whatever situation that they were going through. Now, wait a minute now. That the water was moved periodically. People were waiting for the moving of the water so that they could be healed of whatever was going on in their lives. Let me do it one more time. The people were waiting. They, I can picture them standing there waiting and watching it and not going to turn to the left or to the right. Waiting on the water to start moving because they knew at that moment there was a possibility of being rid of whatever it was that held them. Can I tell somebody that the world is waiting? Okay, two things. First of all, the world is waiting. The world wants to see what the church is going to do. They're waiting to see when God is going to move us to the place where we are open enough so that they can have their lives change. Can I talk to Saint Peter particularly? God, they're, they're waiting on us to go to the park. They're waiting on us to go door to door. They're waiting on us to stand in who we are and say, the Lord will change your life. They're waiting on us to go and say, come find out about a man who will change your life. They're waiting to neighbor, they're waiting. And they're watching. And I mean, the truth is, the truth is that folk that come to church, we'll be honest, we passed about 15, 20 seconds. There are those who come to church because there is expectation, possibility, and potential here, but they're still waiting to see what's going to jump off. And perhaps when it jumps off, their lives will be changed. Now, let me be clear that there's possibility. The reason why a lot of folk come to church because they say something could happen at the church. You know, they, they're not going to the recreation center because they say nothing's going to happen over there. I just get a little work out of here. They, they, they're not watching with the same expectation going to the mall. All they even get to the mall is ability to spend some money to get something that ain't going to last no long time. They're, they're, they're looking for the church for an impact. And folk come to church, I want you to understand, are, are waiting and watching because they believe that there's a potential for something to happen. But this way it gets real. This way it gets real. They're waiting on this angel to move. So there's a possibility of being rid of whatever disease they had. There's a possibility of getting over bad relationships. There's a possibility of getting over a sickness in your body. There's a possibility of getting over of emotional challenges. There's a possibility of getting over the depression you had because of what's going on in your life. The possibility rests where God is. But there got to be a little more encounter. Verse 5 tells us what happens. Here's where it gets good. People waiting. That's one thing. They got problems. Two things. They're waiting for something to happen that would change their situation. So they're there for a situation change. But verse 5 tells us this is how, this is how your change really comes. A certain man. I love when it says certain man. because God wants us to know it's not so much about the man's name. It's just about the fact that the Lord chose him. Sometimes we get caught up in titles and names. I think that's the only folk. Because of the Lord has said, Dr. So-and-so, or, or Professor So-and-so, or Attorney So-and-so, or Principal So-and-so, we would have thought that it was only uh, valid to that position or that or certain positions. But the Bible says there was a certain man. 
Don't know his name, don't know too much about that man's background except for the fact that he had an infirmity for 30 and 8 years. Now later in chapter 4, 5 verse 14 we find out that, now once you watch this, in chapter 5 verse 14 we do find out that his situation came from something that he had done earlier because Jesus went to him after the situation was over and said now go and live a better life than you lived before. So we do know that this man A had a problem, B he had had it for 38 years. Now here's why I want us to hold right here for a second. Some of us have been wrestling with stuff for a long time. But I stopped by saying to tell you, I don't care how long you've been wrestling, whatever you've been wrestling with, it's not too deep and it's not too intrinsic and not too systemic for the Lord to change your situation. Now, let me turn that around another way. When you talk to somebody who comes to you and says, I've been wrestling with this year in and year out, I don't think it'll change. You can tell them, I know a doctor. I know a specialist. I, I know a professional who, who his whole specialty is turning around seemingly impossible situations. Because I believe that this man had been going through this for so long that some folks thought his life would never change. But he had an encounter with Jesus. Look at it now. Look at it. There was a certain man he had an infirmity 30 years. But this is verse 6. Jesus saw him. Yeah, y'all see what verse is. Jesus saw him again. Jesus didn't just happen by that place. He was on divine appointment just as surely as he had an appointment with the woman at the well. Just as surely as he had an appointment with the nobleman regarding his son. Jesus had an appointment with this man right here in Jerusalem by Bethesda. He saw him. In other words, I believe this in my spiritual mind. Jesus came down this way looking for him because he knew that this man was waiting on him. And I want somebody to know, I don't care where you've been or what you've been through, the Lord knows right where you are. Somebody tell your neighbor, the Lord knows right where you are. He knows, he knows right. You might think you've been in the darkness, but God sees in the dark. You might think you've been in the cut, but God knows where the cut is located, and God can get to you in the cut. You may think that you're outside of the purview of God, but I don't care where you are. We serve an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God. He is everywhere and sees everything. Jesus saw him. Somebody said, Jesus saw him. Somebody, I'll make it personal. Jesus sees me. He saw him and he sees me. He knows where he was. He saw him, verse 6 says, lying down. And look what it says. And he knew. Jesus knew. He, he knew. He didn't need somebody to give him a chart. He, he didn't need somebody to give him a report. He didn't need a triage. He didn't need the nurse to come in and say, Dr. Jesus. Jesus knew. That's what happens when you serve a power of God. He already knows. That's what you serve when you serve a God who sits high yet looks low. He knows. That's what happens when you serve a God who is able to control everything by the power of his word. He already knows. He knew that he had been there a long time in that situation. He knew it. But then, that's the second beautiful part about verse 6. Jesus saw him. The next part is Jesus said it to him. He saw him. See, some of us would have saw him. But we wouldn't have said nothing. We, we, might not, we wouldn't have said nothing to him. We might have said something to somebody else. Like, look how bad this situation is. Well, that's messed up. He's been like that 38 years. Some of us might have called somebody on the phone. Guess what? I saw this man down there today broken. He's been like that. Isn't that terrible? Jesus saw him, but he said something to him. He didn't say nothing to his friends because he didn't have no friends. Jesus said something to him. I wish I had somebody saw how important that is. I, I'm glad I serve a God who not only sees who I am, but every now and then he'll speak to me right where I am. I don't care where I am, how far I've walked. He sees me and he will speak to me out of where I am. Anybody in here ever been lost and you left the Lord but you heard the voice of the Lord say come on. Anybody ever been there? Anybody ever been disobedient to God and God didn't turn his back on you but he said I still love you. Come on back. To I'm glad. Commercial break. The church. 
as we live here in this world have to be the legs, the arms, the hands, the mouth of Jesus. We got to see folk, but then we got to say something to the folk we see. See, it's, 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 it's with the situation in the world is too tough for us just to see somebody with a problem and walk right by them. We have to see them and be willing to say something to them so that they can know about the Lord. If we see them and don't say it, we wasted time. We wasted time and we just see folk in problems and say, well, I'll deal with that later. You, we don't have time to wait. With the government passing legislation like they're passing, with, with the government being insidious and coming against people, we have to be willing. The only transformative agent in the whole world is the body of Christ. I'm talking about real transformation. That's some good organizations. But I'm talking about can change your life, can get you off your back on your feet, can get you from broken down to picked up, to take you from hopeless to hopeful. It comes through the Lord. Jesus saw him and he spoke to him. But when he spoke to him, it was an interesting question. It was an inquisitory, it was a question, a query. Jesus said, Will you be made whole? Do you want to be made whole? Do you want your life to be changed? Oh, I wondered about this. I've been reading this since I was a little boy. Why would Jesus ask a man who's been sick 38 years, does he want to be well? Let me get take it a little further. Why would Jesus ask a man who's been sick 38 years, who is showing up at this place, waiting for the water to be moved so that he can be here? Why would Jesus, in fact, ask that man, does he want to be made? Why would Jesus do him that way? But I realize the Lord knows everything. It's what he does know. Sometimes your situation can get the best of you and cause you to just go through the motions and not really be ready for a change to come on your life. Jesus said this not to humiliate this man, but he said this to electrify this man, to get him ready for what was coming next. In other words, some folk, and I got to do this right here, come to church Sunday after Sunday with no expectation that their lives will change. I, I'm talking tur turkey here now. Some folk get up, get dressed, come with a mindset that I'm just going to church, but I'm not really expecting nothing to happen. And Jesus had to poke this man spiritually mentally and emotionally to get him ready for what he was about to do for him. That's why sometimes, sometimes when you when you're in a situation and somebody seems like they're attacking you, it may just be the Lord poking you to wake you up. To poking you to get your attention, poking you so that you will get your, your ability to com comprehend uh, and lined up so that you can see what the Lord is about to do. Well, the Bible says. This impotent man responded to Jesus. Now look at this response. He said, Son, I have no man. I don't have any friends. I don't have the money to get staff. I, I don't have first cousins that are that are capable or willing to help me. I, 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 I don't have anybody who can help me when the water begins to move who can then pick me up because I can't do it myself. I don't have the leg strength. I don't have the arm strength. I, I don't have the ability of muscular or skeletally to move from this place where I am to get to the pool. I would get closer, sir, but it's too hot out there for me to sit out there all day. I'm sitting back here under the porch because I want to be close as I can without causing harm to myself, but I don't have nobody. It looks like when I'm almost there, somebody beats me to the drop. That's what he just said. Somebody beats me to the draw. Look like sometimes I've got up. I've got the strength to sit up, but I couldn't get up. I got the strength to move a little bit, but I couldn't get where I was trying to go. And it looked like sometimes when I got close to my breakthrough, somebody beat me to the punch. That's what happened, sir. I want to. 
but I feel like I'm by myself. I want to, but I need some help. I wish, but my wishes don't come true. Here's where the beauty is of the Lord. The Lord doesn't need nobody to help him help you. He doesn't need to get a committee together. He doesn't need to gather together some uh, folk to have titles and abilities. He doesn't, he doesn't need to convene a group or a caucus, a group of folk together to discuss the problem. The Lord doesn't need anybody. Here's the thing. When we understand that trusting in anybody else won't get you anywhere, but trusting in the Lord will get you exactly where you need to be, that's when our lives will be changed. See, it, it, it's all right to watch and wait, but when you're watching, waiting for somebody else to help you, can I tell you, half the folk you want to help you don't want to help you. That's it. The other half of the folk can't help you even if they wanted to. But the one somebody who's available 24-7 to provide you whatever help you need, that's who you ought to be focusing on. Jesus wanted this man to say it so that the man would know when the change came, he didn't have to thank his cousin or his best friend. He had to thank the Lord. Is there anybody in here you look back over your life you realize it wasn't nobody but the Lord that brought you out of your darkness. It wasn't nobody but the Lord that brought you through your situation. It might have looked like it was somebody else but it wasn't nobody but the Lord. And when we can see that we're prepped and ready for a transformation in our lives. When you put your whole trust in the Lord That's why sometimes when I'm going through, I try to remember that song. I was young, but now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed bread, bread. You can't trust somebody else to feed you. You trust the Lord, and he will. This man in verse 7 gave his summary of his situation. Jesus did not address his summary. Jesus did not try to tell him where he had gone wrong. Jesus did not give him a list of folks that he could call on the next time. Jesus did not give him, you ever had somebody that when you tell them your problem, they tell you, well, I wish I'd known, I would've. Y'all know, y'all might not know them folk. Some of us know folk like that. They, as soon as you, as soon as you identify, well, I didn't know you had a problem, I could've. Oh, I would that, That's why Jesus didn't tell him it was called Johnny, because Johnny may be able to help him. Because Johnny would say, Oh, I didn't know. But he said, Look at verse 8. Jesus said unto him, This lame, impotent man, who for 38 years had been laying by the same place, waiting on something to happen to change his life. Jesus spoke to a man who had not walked in 30 eight years who had been laying in the same place in the same circumstance in the same I'm going to do that one more time Jesus had the nerve to tell a man who had not walked for 38 years to get up pick up the thing he was laying on and get back to walking now, we got to dissect this when we go home. We're going home, but we got to dissect this first. Because in the dissection will give us the revelation to what it is we need to do. First and foremost, Jesus did not try to do anything but speak what he wanted to happen. He spoke it. He said, rise. He didn't, he didn't say, see if you can walk. See, some of us would have said, see if you can walk. Let me get you by the hand. Jesus didn't need to help him up. Jesus simply said, rise. Jesus didn't need to tell nobody, but let him go to therapy first. Let him go through some processes first. Jesus said, rise. He didn't say, get him a walker or get him some crutches or get him a wheelchair. Jesus told a man who hadn't walked in 30 years, get out. Now the reason why Jesus was able to say it. And, and mean it because Jesus knew that he had control of that situation. He was able to tell this man to get up because he knew that his words were not just good words. He knew that his words were not just wise words. Jesus knew that his word had power. 
In other words, it wasn't the letters of the word, it was who spoke the words. In other words, you can get some good advice from a whole lot of people, but when you're in the word of God, the word can change your life. You can hear what Oprah got to say, you can hear what Dr. Field is saying, you can listen to the radio, but I'm talking about a powerful word comes from the Lord. It's found somewhere between Genesis and Revelation. There is a word that will change your life. It may be in Genesis. It may be in Leviticus. It may be in Exodus. But somewhere there's a word that will change your life. It might be in 1st or 2nd Kings or 1st and 2nd Chronicles. But there's a word. That's why. That's why. It's so important for you not just to come to church, but it's important for you to be a person who walks in the Word. Let me say this one more time. It's not enough just to hang out at church. Because if you hang out at church, you might mess around and see somebody else's life change. And you wonder why your life won't change. Being in the building won't change you, but being in the Word will change your life. Can I do a one more commercial break here? Let me tell somebody about it. Oh, here, Reverend, Reverend Burr, let me tell you what I read. I read that if a church has 25% of their people in Bible study, then the church ought to deem that a success. And I've said this before, I'll say it again. 25% of anything is failure. Get a 25% on your test, you failed that test. Your, your 25% is failing. The church cannot sit back and say, it's all right when we got a handful of folk in the Bible says, we ought to want everybody there because the word can change your life. The word of the Lord is that powerful. He told this man, rise, pick up that bed, and walk. I like the instruction, but I like the detail of the instruction even more. If Jesus had just said, rise, this man might have just stood and enjoyed and reveled in the fact that he could stand. But Jesus didn't let him ride off just with a stand. Jesus told him that to get up and take up his bed. I like that right there because Jesus wanted to know you won't need that no more. You, you've been using it for a long time. Is stinking of you sitting on it for long. Can I tell somebody in St. Peter, someone's been sitting in the same place for long. We've called that same place to stink. You got to get rid of some stuff so that you can go to the next phase of what God wants you to do. Jesus said, rise, get your stuff and pack your stuff and get rid of that stuff so that you can begin the new life that I have for you. Jesus was telling him for 38 years you ain't moved the inch. But now you got some ground to cover. For 38 years you've been supposed to stand in that impotent, but I'm about to put some potency in your limbs so that you can get to work. I, for 38 years you've been sitting there day in and day out, but I got a, a journey for you. I got a destination for you. I got a destination that results from your transformation. You got some testifying. You got some example life there, and I want somebody to know that whatever you've been through, when God brings you out, you got to get the moving. Don't, don't get delivered and just sit on your deliverance. When God brings you out, you ought to lift up holy hands and walk right, live right, love right, act right, and tell somebody else about a man named Jesus. I'm about to go to my seat. The Bible says it immediately. I shout every time I read that word. Immediately. In other words, somehow or another. When Jesus said, rise, take up thy bed and walk. That there was some kind of surgical action that took place. When Jesus said, rise, take up thy bed and walk. There was some therapeutic power that came just out of the word that began to move because the Bible says immediately the man was made whole. In other words, a broken man who for 28 years had been broken, withered, lame, and halt. When Jesus spoke, there was something about the words that caused a healing to take place in that man's body. I want us to understand that every healing ain't a physical body healing, but some healings are spiritual healings, but will get you going the same way. If you're sick in your soul, I know 
somebody who got a prescription for your soul sin sickness. If you're spiritually now, I got somebody who will give you a spiritual upper that will get you out of the doldrums and out of your oppression. If you're spiritually broken, I know somebody who can say a word and you're spiritually whole. This man was made whole simply because Jesus said it. Got up, picked up his bed, and he walks. And I'm going to tell you two more points, and I'm done. There were some folk, the Jews, who were upset about his curing. They did not look at the fact that a broken man was made whole, but they looked at the fact that he was healed on a day when there was no uh, approval for healing. And I want you to know that there's always going to be somebody who got a problem with your transformation. There's always going to be somebody who can outline what you did wrong. There's always going to be somebody who got the evil lie of sneak out when God does something for your life. But I want you to know that you ought to have your testimony ready. Because the Bible says that when they came to this man and asked this man what happened, he said, that was a man. Don't know much about him, but there was a man who told me to get up my bed and walk, and I got up and walk, and I'm not worried about when he did it, or where he did it, or how he did it. I'm just glad that I was able to get up when I couldn't get up before. I'm glad that I was able to move like I could move before. I'm glad that I could just go skip it off because I met a man, and I'm, I want you to know that when you know Jesus, you ought to have your testimony ready. You ought to be ready. To tell somebody God will make a way. You ought to be ready to tell somebody God will give you a bridge over to the water. You ought to be ready to tell somebody I was down but now I'm up. You ought to be ready to tell somebody I was broke but now I'm full. You ought to be ready. Won't he do it? How many know he'll do it? How many know he'll pick you up and turn you around? He'll plant your feet on solid ground. How many know he's a battle axe in a time of battle? How many know he's a shelter in a time of sorrow? How many know God can do whatever needs to be done? I'm glad. I'm glad. Don't you be a watcher and a waiter. But you got to be willing so that you can get well. You got to be able to come clean with yourself. And you got to move when the Lord say moves. When he say get up, don't call your friend and say, look here, Sally. The Lord told me to move. Should I move? You ought to get up and get to going. So that you can do what the Lord has called you to do. Can I say this? I'm gone. Whatever your situation, whatever your circumstance, Whatever you're going through, whatever you're in right now, know this, that God is able to bring you out. Don't, don't doubt that. This man didn't have time to doubt because the Lord just asked him a question and spoke to his situation. When the Lord, this man got to hear the word, when the Lord speaks to you and you hear his voice and you feel his presence, get to moving, doing what the Lord told you to do. If you can stand on your feet today, just stand for just a moment. First of all, in order for us to do what the Lord has called us to do, we got to be fixed or being fixed on ourselves. So if you're here, you don't have to necessarily move somewhere, but if you're here, this is a moment of decision for all believers. You can commit yourself, say, I know the Lord is speaking. I know he speaks every day in his word, but I just want to hear it and I'm going to commit myself to hearing his word so that my transformation will come.